I want to welcome all our viewers to the interview on the Latin Report on Sovereign Identity. And I'd like to welcome tonight Ken Wan and Alex Leitman to share some light, first of all, guys, on the difference on sovereign identity and digital identity. We hear these phrases a lot. And actually, I would like to start to explain to the community what is actually the difference between sovereign identity and digital identity? Maybe, Ken, you can share some light on this. Okay, so traditionally, we are still on the like traditional word, the digital identity, right? The main idea is uh, all the identities in centralized database. And then it's usually uh, controlled by a uh, secret or pass password. And there is certain kind of privilege in terms of access to certain uh, applications or service. Uh, but the main problem with it is uh, there is, it's centralized for the hacker. The hacker can go just to a single database to get all the data. It happens with the Yahoo, Kmart, uh, with uh, Equifax, or all, all this uh, kind of uh, data leak uh, in the centralized identity. Another main issue with centralized identity is user really don't have the control of the data, how they are used, how can they actually make uh, uh, profit from this data because uh, you are the owner of the data. So that's why uh, there's other problem, but this was the main problem. Other problem including you basically have to remember password everywhere and for you, like your data is uh, fragmented into different database, right? Like you may have your data in uh, Yahoo, you may have data in Google or in Microsoft or in Amazon, but you don't have your single authorized, like authoritative view of what your data is. So all this leads to Web3.0. So the key tenants of Web3.0 is the decentralized identity. The user has the control of their identity. So they may have some uh, of the uh, public identity that they can control, they can review to the other, and they can make profit of it. And then maybe they have some private identity that they don't want to review. But if you, you really want to uh, other people to use it, you, make, uh, you have the control of say, hey, which piece, particular piece of data can be shared. And also there is a certain identity has to be certified by third party. Once certified, uh, and, and you can still use it. Like uh, example, like uh, if I graduated from certain university, that university must certify that actually I was graduated from that university. But then this data belongs to me. And other people, if they really want to know that if I actually graduate from that university, they have to validate with the public key of this issuer. The issuer is the university who can sign this what is called as a verifiable claim. They can sign it. Once they sign it, it's, uh, you can verify it because it's public keys available. It's, uh, it can be on chain. And, uh, most importantly, you don't really want to put all the PII data on the blockchain. You only put the proof or the signature or the hash of the signature on the blockchain. So in summary, like uh, we are currently move from traditional digital identity to the decentralized identity. It will unlock lots of economic uh, values from it. That's why like a transition from web 2.0 to web 3.0, it's uh, uh, really a, the idea of a transition from information technology to data technology, DT. So uh, we can talk more about that, but uh, in the high level. It's, uh, what it is. When you hear Ken's explanation about the differences between sovereign identity moving into digital identity, but also the difference between 
I would say things you want to, the public to know about you, uh, the things you want to hold private. If you then go and look, would you say that sovereign identity is more of a centralized controlled situation still? Well, I wouldn't say that, no. Um, I, I would say it the whole thing derives, as far as I can tell, from the book, The Sovereign Individual by James Dale Davidson and Lord uh, Rees Mogg in the UK. And they basically say, nation states are going to crumble. You're gonna get failed states. And so you have to look at yourself as a nation of one, and you have to be ready to move from country to country and have your own credentials with you. So if we look at what's happening in the United States right now, we have a crumbling of the centrally provided credentials. One of those things is that a, a common insult about Americans is that more than 90% of Americans don't have passports. So it's already something that a minority of people have. We just don't go and see other countries. It's why we're not all that well aware of how the rest of the world works. I've been to 88 countries, but I'm an anomaly. And I have two passports uh, because I have, I'm always having one in for a visa so that I can do that. And that's legal, of course. Uh, they're both by the same name. But the United States has not issued any passports since March. So this is an example of a single point of failure that you can't travel without a passport. And the US hasn't been giving those passports for three months. And my guess is that this could continue until the election. And so what happens if you're not getting a passport for six or seven months? So the idea of self-sovereign identity is that you are a nation of one and you're responsible for your own credentials and you provide them and you provide them, as Ken said, with a hash or on a blockchain or whatever, but you are in charge. Uh, Brittany Kaiser, who's one of the, the whistleblowers from Cambridge Analytica, has talked about and uh, own your data. So it's basically owning your data and within data, perhaps the most singularly important data is your credentials. How do you prove you are you both in the real world and online? So many people during these riots and protests are saying, show me ID. And it's a big debate around the world. Should you have to have a national ID or not? Should, you be, should a policeman on the street be able to ask you for identity? And similarly online, how do you know it's you if purchases are being made in your name? How do you know it's you if a bank account is being accessed? So there are people who have had their entire, all their crypto stolen or all their fiat stolen or all their medical records stolen and, or, or been uh, stalked because they didn't control their own identity and there was a security breach in a centralized data facility. So if we owned our own data and we had, let's say, a thousand IPv6 addresses and we only let certain people use certain IPv6 addresses so you have universal addressable identity with your own credentials, you start to have a system that is not the worst of all possible worlds like we have now where cyber crime accounts are over 400, mil, uh, 400 billion a year in losses. So this is where crypto meets government in a very serious way and crypto has a much better answer. Would you say, Alex, I, I, I'm astonished at the, at the fact that you can't get travel documents. I mean, it's a serious economic handicap when you need to go you know, to it's whatever. It's a disaster for businesses that have to go and get. Entrepreneur to, to fix whatever, um, you know, you can't travel. And I think on the other hand, if you look at, let me put a very interesting case, okay? Because digital identity is supposed to deliver us the solutions for the future to get rid of the handicaps that we have now. That's basically what we're looking for, you know? More control, more stable, but also uh, reliability. Now let's suppose for a large part of the world, they're underbanked or non-banked. You're in Africa or Asia or another area of the world that's suffered from various problems. You don't know when you've been born. Your parents have perished or disappeared. You don't have an address. You don't own any assets like a house or an address or whatever, but you still want access to the international financial system. So how do you give people like that an identity? Ken, have you got a vision for that? Because we're talking 3.2 billion people on this planet. Yeah, so currently the uh, technical infrastructure is still 
need a little bit of uh, the work in terms of uh, the scalability and the security privacy control. Well, what we're going to do is with DNA, fingerprint, because it has to have a biological connection somehow to prove it's me. You know, right, right, yes. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it's not just techn technological, it's also in terms of the policy and also the regula regulatory perspective uh -huh. of this work. But I, I would say the technology perspective, we still need to flush out uh, what I call the ISOPC. The, um, the I is the identity itself, S is security. O is Oracle basically provided some reliable data to the, to the smart contract on chain. And then we need the uh, decent level of performance and then have to have the cross chain capability. So uh, that's uh, you know, what the, the DNA is working on. I think it's also invite other people to do some innovation on these five uh, pillars of the blockchain. And unfortunately, even you look at some mainstream blockchain, they only like focus one or two of this aspect, not all five aspects of this. So not that's the five we see, not right? the five. No, I agree. Alex, when you look at this, because this is a fundamental problem that we're struggling with worldwide on all sorts of levels that we can't secure who's who in the situation that we need to deal with verification or whatever. So what do you see as a future solution for this enormous problem? Because it is a worldwide problem. Anybody who has no access to any economic traffic is, well, basically on the back bench. You know, you can't get access to a world, uh, you know, where there is possibility of, I would say, growth in health and wealth and, you know, basically getting access to what a large part of the world has no access to at the moment. So how, if how do if, if I were asked by the government of the Democratic Republic of Congo or Chad or a country that had these issues, what mm -hmm. I would do is I would, uh, I would recommend a policy that's based on what the Grameen uh, Bank did in Bangladesh. They got together groups of five or more women who would pool money and buy a cell phone and then they would rent it out and they would get micro loans that had an extremely high repayment rate. I think that as you set up these kind of groups that you could basically give an identity that you just say your name for the purpose of the group. And then your credentials say, this person was part of this group, got this loan, paid it back. And then you start from there. I think you start from, from frankly, from giving people credit because then they have a credit score and attach their name and they have the relationship and their identity is attested to and then you can go and make hyperlinks to the other four people or five people in the group. And then you can look at them. And so you basically start where you start from ab, ab nilio, ab, of nothing. You start out of nothing with a group. I don't think that if you, if you can't get someone into a group where they're all in it and they can verify each other as being in that group and having done this, I, I don't see a way that you can have it more atomic than that. So I think the atomic unit of trust and identity is five or more people, each of whose identity you can look at. And then as they do more things within that group and within that system, they get more and more levels. So perhaps they take an online course uh, and get a certificate. And you can even learn to read and get a certificate in learning to read. So we have in the mobile phone, we have a pocket college, we have a pocket bank, we have a pocket uh, group, we have a pocket loan syndicate, we have all these things. And then we keep track of them all according to this kind of container. And the container is semi-transparent uh, semi or semi-permeable. So you can have certain requests for identity go in, you can evaluate them and decide whether you want to show one or more of your, your credentials within that. And then for other people, I mean, I should have an identity that has nothing to do with the US government. You should have one that has nothing to do with the Netherlands government. And we should be able to have our identity based on how we are and how we are in the world. And it should have things like volunteer hours worked and someone and money donated to charity and number of people helped, you know, uh, things like that. Uh, Brock Pierce likes to say that a billionaire is somebody who has positively influenced the lives of a billion people. Hey, if you do that, 
that should be part of your credentials. That should be right up front. I think to, to end it, Ken, if we listen to Alex about actually we are not talking proof of work, proof of stake or delegated proof of stake or whatever, we're moving towards then um, proof of, I would say almost trust, because if you repay something, apparently you can be trusted to be having a loan or um, how, how would we substantiate this new item? Because I think it's a key, key cornerstone of digital identity that somewhere we create trust on this digital identity. So would you say that we go into an era, Ken, of a proof of trust? So I, I would uh, say the consensus algorithm and as identity, they work tandem in tandem, right? So the uh, idea of the uh, self-sovereign identity or decentralized identity, this is a foundational piece for the reputation-based economy, uh, what uh, Alex suggests. So if you own your identity, you can build the reputation on top of it. Uh, but uh, the one uh, which ensures the integrity of this uh, reputation still is the public chain. It is still need the leverages of consensus algorithm that could be POW, uh, traditionally the Nakimoto consensus algorithm, or could be PBFT, uh, any kind of Byzantine fourth tolerance algorithm, or some new consensus algorithm. There's no perfect algorithm yet. It's really based on different use cases, right? But uh, if we have the combined technology of the reputational based DID and the consensus algorithm based on this DID, that actually open a new uh, area of innovation or research, which could be uh, fueling the public chain as well, it's as well as the consortium chain. The permission the chain, right? Uh, it's more like in the permission the chain, you really need the DID or even the traditional digital identity. But in this public chain, you can still have uh, the DID and the consensus algorithm to work with that, to leverage that you actually have the reputation of the, the identity that you can actually make your consensus algorithm more optimized, more scalable than POW. I think to sum it up, because we have to close, this is a subject right. that we definitely are going to talk about together again uh, as a threesome and maybe Eric will join. Uh, we're about to start rollout of the DNA dual chain part, the second part. And over time, obviously, digital identity is going to be a vital point of development in this new technology to get to the point where we reach what we just discussed. So it's for sure not the last time that we have it on the table. For now, I want to thank you both for enlightening the community somewhat more as to what digital identity and sovereign identity actually is and that we have to do with a I would say a new playing field between public, decentralized, private and public and how much you want to give to the public as information. And on the other hand, how much trust you want to receive in transactions and other things from the public. So for now, I want to thank you both, Kang Wan. We will see you back again. And Alex, thank you. We're looking forward to the next discussion because over the next couple of months, digital identity, sovereign identity, and everything around it is going to be a vital topic because uh, within Metaverse DNA, they see it as one of the key principles of development for the new dual chain. So I want to thank you guys for now and say goodbye. And we have another, oh, very important, 24th of July, we're going to have another cloud conference. And maybe it's mm. a good idea if both of you from a different area have a little say about what actually is the future of digital identity. I want to say thank you for now and see you all next time. Bye bye. Thank you, Anamika. Thank you, bye -bye. Ken. Yeah, bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you, Alex and Nick. Bye bye.